We're gonna be covering different layers of finishing an earth wall. We're gonna be covering some earth engineering. And also this is a really good stage to talk about because we can see all of the different layers involved and how they work together. I'm also gonna try a little bit of a different format. I'm going to strap you onto my forehead and we'll go around, talk about the build, and then we'll sling some mud. Okay, so we are on the Foxhole Homes property in Southern New Mexico. For the past few years, I've just been picking away at this project. This is a shed. The structure of the shed is not actually earth. It is concrete. These cinder blocks that I've stacked along here and I've alternated them so that they could key into the wall going both directions. And then there's a concrete ring beam all the way around the top. And there's a concrete uh, stem wall that's covered by this flagstone. Now, then the earth wall is in situ adobe, which is cast in place adobe bricks. You can kind of see the forms of the bricks still here. They make these T blocks. I'll actually show you the forms that I use. This is the boneyard for the build. So these are my in situ adobe forms. This form, which if it was, you know, just this two by all the way around could just be a regular adobe form but all you really do is you extend the sides of the form down so that they lap over the previous course where there's a gap in between the blocks underneath and you pour or pack your adobe or your structural earth material into the form and then once it's dry enough or immediately if you're packing dry enough you can just take the form off move it and then do another brick directly on the wall. The advantage of the C2 Adobe method is you can build an Adobe wall without the intermediate step of making your bricks off to the side in a yard or wherever they are, allowing them to dry and then taking them and using them on your build. With this, you can mix your material and just build the wall with it directly. You also eliminate the mortaring step, which is a, a big labor saver. Now compared with cob, which is kind of this also you can mix material and place it directly on the wall. Because cob is not form assisted in any way, it has to be able to support itself while it's being built, while it's still wet. And because of that, the walls generally have to be a lot thicker than an adobe wall has to be. Adobe walls usually are a minimum of 10 inches, especially if they're structural. This wall is actually only eight inches thick. And that's only because the structure is actually the concrete. And so the adobe wall isn't actually structural. If it was structural, I would have made it at least 10 inches thick. Traditional adobe is usually at least 10 inches thick and cob walls are usually no less than 16, 18. So you save a lot of material this way. Having a good thick wall is a good thing. You definitely want thicker material in a lot of cases, but in this case, especially it's a shed. It doesn't matter to me if the wall is a little bit thinner. Now you'll notice uh, on these cinder blocks, I have put some decking screws in a, a pattern. When I was building this, I wasn't sure exactly how I was gonna finish it. Uh, I thought maybe I'd do earth plaster over the earth wall and then do a lime or something over the cement. But I've decided at some point I wanted to do an earth finish around the entire building. And because of that, also because the wall was pretty uneven, I under-engineered my in situ adobe forms. These forms really need some two by material around the edges and maybe one down through the middle to force the plywood to stay flat. As I was building, the bottom of the plywood would kind of flare out a bit and that led to some pretty uneven spots on my wall, which I'm dealing with now, which is another reason why I want to build the wall up thicker instead of trying to chop it down, which would be really difficult because this material is very, very hard. So there's a problem though that, you know, earth is not gonna adhere to the cinder blocks, not the same material. Where the earth wall is, I can soak that with water and then the new material is really the same earth going on. It'll meld into it and grab onto it really well but not the concrete. So I have to have some way to mechanically tie the earth to the cinder block so it'll stay there. You might be wondering, well, why not just put lath over the cinder blocks? I mean, that's very common. First of all, never put earth plaster on metal lath. In fact, in general, you should really just avoid using lath except as a last resort. Any subtle forces that are acting on these screws that might cause them to expand or contract, it's just gonna be happening very localized on that one screw instead of being spread out over the whole piece of lath. This is really the best way to apply a large amount of an earth plaster. And you'll see up at the top plates around the underneath the roof, you'll see I have porcupine. I call this porcupining all the way around to help the 
earth grab on up there. So wood decking screws like this, which are cheap, these are not meant to go into concrete. This is a Tapcon screw. This is the appropriate screw to use when tying any structural elements to concrete or doing any kind of serious tying to, to concrete or cement block. I use Tapcons when attaching my door framing. The flagstones at the bottom are also attached with uh, Tapcon screws to the concrete footing or stem wall. But Tapcon screws are very expensive and so I wanted to use decking screws for this. But if you screw a hole the appropriate size for a decking screw into concrete and try to screw it in, it'll just break. It's not designed to be able to handle being screwed into concrete. So you have to make a hole bigger than the decking screw, but then the screw won't go in very firmly. So you just have to put a little bit of wood in the hole, then put the screw in, and then it's gonna go in there nice and firm and, and hold. I put toothpicks in all the holes after I drilled them and then put the screws in and now they're in there perfectly solidly. I also have these vents along the bottom, which were when I initially started this project, you can kind of see them I actually started building this wall with Adobe bricks that I was making. And then at a certain point I switched to the NC2 Adobe when I realized that uh, I could save a lot of time and energy by doing that. But I put a couple cinder blocks sideways at the bottom of the wall so that I could have some air ventilation and uh, this little framing I did. I also attached to the cinder blocks here the same way with the toothpicks and the decking screws. Don't tie any, you know, serious things or structural elements to concrete this way, but it is a way to save a lot of money when you got to do something like this where you need a lot of screws and the, it doesn't have to be super, super strong. So that was kind of one of the biggest experiments with this project. And uh, I have to say it's working great. It's on there. I mean, it's it's solid. When I was putting it on, it, it felt really solid. As soon as it gets on there, it grips around those screws and dries. It's just, it's working very well. The drilling holes in concrete is not an easy task exactly. This would have been much easier. If I had the foresight to know I was gonna be doing this, I definitely would have screwed the holes before I built the wall so that I could do them vertically down onto the bricks instead of having to do it sideways. I went through a lot of bits too. Masonry bits for drilling into cement are really only good for 100 holes and that's if you're really careful with them. And I had about 1200 holes <laughs> to drill. That was not fun but it's done now and uh, I'm definitely satisfied with the results. It's an absolutely beautiful day for earthworks. I think it's in the mid 50s but when the wind dies down it feels like 60s. Welcome to January in Southern New Mexico. The foundation is a rubble trench foundation. Uh, I dug the trench, filled it with uh, river rock and gravel. And on top of that, there's a eight inch tall, eight inch above grade, I should say, concrete stem wall. Uh, generally speaking, you want to avoid putting earth directly onto grade. Any moisture that's resting on the ground can soak into the wall and damage it. You want to have if it's not concrete, then a stone stem wall or something for something waterproof for the earth to sit on. And this concrete is uh, continuous rebar reinforced concrete. And let me show you the rebar we put in this thing. I uh, went to a scrapyard to get rebar for the project. And the scrapyard I went to was just selling all their rebar by the foot and not distinguishing between size. All right, I might as well get the thickest rebar they have. And this is the stuff right here one inch thick. It was uh, leftover scraps from a highway project. This thing actually has one inch rebar continually around the ring beam, tied down through the corners, tied into the stem wall all the way around, continuous one inch rebar reinforced concrete. Definitely way, way overkill. Uh, it does not need to be that. In fact, probably the sturdiest above ground building for a long ways, especially, in, and that's including the two military bases nearby. Now it's worth noting, I could have done the whole thing, earth all the way around, absolutely. It would have been totally fine. This mix would make an excellent structural earth wall. I would have had to make it a couple inches thicker because a structural earth wall should really be no less than 10 inches. And that's only if it's, you know, eight, to eight feet tall or so. As a general rule, structural earth walls should be at least 10% as thick as they are tall. So if you have a 10 foot wall, you want it to be at least a foot thick and it's better if they're even thicker than that. But uh, I was already kind of experimenting with the NC2 Adobe method at the time. I wasn't super confident at that point. At this point I am. And so I definitely, if I could go back in time, I probably would just do the whole building solid earth all the way around and just not, not use the concrete. But at the same time, I'm glad I did this because I got to 
figure out the uh, tying the earth plaster to the concrete. Doing the whole thing in earth would have had its own challenges as well. In construction, we always regret the decisions we didn't make when we're dealing with the consequences of the decisions that we did make, but the other decisions had their own challenges too. You might be wondering why there's expanding foam all the way around the top at the plate, and that's because I didn't do a very good job <laughs> on the ring beam when we poured it. I just didn't engineer the forms very well. I didn't vibrate it and make it nice. I didn't get it nice and flat on top. And then I didn't make the sill plates nice and flat and, and sealed too. So there are a lot of gaps. And you might think, well, you're gonna cover it with earth, so what's the big deal? And the problem with that is that, yeah, I'm, I've decided to do the earth all the way up to the bottom of the joists, but they're going, the earth is going to meet the wood at the top of the wall. And where it does, it's not going to seal there because the wood and the earth are not compatible materials like that. I've got the nails to help it mechanically grip onto it, but there's not gonna be a seal. And so air could get down in there. And if there's ways for the air to get through underneath, then that's a potential way for drafts to get inside for bugs to crawl in. So I sealed it all off and then I'll still do the earth. And then I'll probably still do some kind of seal along the top just to double up on that. Cause I like to double up on those elements wherever possible. And then of course, uh, I'll seal up underneath the, uh, underneath the plywood in the roof as well eventually too. When you're working with earth walls, there are really five categories of layers that go into making the wall complete. There's the core wall, which is this, in this case, it's our NC2 Adobe wall. Maybe it's a tra traditional Adobe cob, rammed earth, compressed earth block, earth bag, bahareke, wattle and daub. There's tons of ways that you can build earthen walls. However you do it, the core wall is just the original wall that you build. And it may or may not be flat and it may or may not need one or more of the remaining layer types to get it finished out. After the core wall, then you have pack out, which is for packing out really deep recesses, holes, areas that need to be brought out to a very roughly flat area. I don't necessarily need to do pack out on the wall itself. However, because I've decided to bring the earth all the way up to the bottom of the joists, at the top of the wall, it steps back into the concrete ring beam, and then it steps back again at the plates. Before I can put the next coat on, I have to bring all that out I have to pack it out with earth so that it's more at closer to the same level as the wall is. And that's what I'm doing right here. See, I've got uh, earth that I've slapped on to help bring it a little bit closer out to the level of the wall. After pack out, you have the scratch coat. Now the scratch coat is a very thick layer of earth plaster that flattens the wall more, fills up a bunch of the voids, but you're still planning on having pretty thick material go on top of it. So the surface is scratched. You can see these ridges that are in the wall. Those create more surface area that let the next layer of plaster go on and have more surface area to grip onto. So you can still put thicker material on, whether that's a second or third scratch coat, or if it's the brown coat that comes on next. And this is my scratch trowel that I'm using. You can either apply with a different tool and then go back over it with a scratch trowel when it's firmed up a bit, or you can just apply with the scratch trowel. In my case, I've mostly been just applying scratch coat with the scratch trowel, so I don't have to go back over it. And the scratch coat just brings the wall to a much more level surface, but still not smooth. So after the scratch coat, then we have the brown coat. The brown coat is the coat right before your finish coat. So this is not the finish. I know it looks really nice and I, it will be left this way for quite some time until I get the rest of the building brought out to a brown stage. There's gonna be one more coat that goes on top of this, the finish coat. But the brown coat goes on once your scratch coats have brought the wall out to a relatively flat surface. And then the brown coat brings it even flatter and it's also smooth. Your brown coat should be the shape of the wall that you want, it should be the flatness of the wall that you want to achieve when it's all done. Because your final, your finished coat is gonna be very thin. It's not really for shaping the wall. It's engineered for aesthetics and protection of the layers underneath. Talk about the bottle bricks. If you are familiar with any Earthship biotexture stuff, you might be familiar with bottle bricks and bottle walls. I didn't really measure out the door opening. It was just this big opening that I knew any door I wanted would fit in. And so I had some air around the sides of the door and I decided to do a little bottle feature. And this is cool. You can see on the inside, it has colored bottle bottoms that kind of create this 
design so you can see the light coming through. And uh, by the way, we'll be doing the same, all the same stuff we're doing on the outside, we'll be doing on the interior. It'll just have a little bit different of a finish. I'm just keeping the bottles clear as I do the layers and eventually the finish layer will kind of uh, clean up around the edges of them a little bit. Let's do a little earth engineering. So we're very lucky here. There's a aggregate company just up the road that sells fill dirt which is clay based and it's this stuff. It's basically comes as a perfect right out of the truck Adobe mix. You could use a little bit of sand in a lot of applications and I am at, gonna be adding sand, but basically it has a composition of m sizes of mineral particles, sand, silt, and clay that is suitable for a structural wall and for finishes. There is a very wide range of earths that will make suitable for construction earth mix and basically as long as you have some clay in your soil you can figure out a way to engineer a structural earth mix. What I'm doing I'm taking and just throw our dirt uh, onto the sifter. It gets out all of the larger stones, pieces of gravel and clumps of solidified dirt that you don't want. It gives you a nice soft pile of dirt. And so I've been pulling from this pile right here. Ever want a cheap source for buckets for your construction project, sandwich shops, burger places that include pickle spears with their burgers. Any restaurant or place that sells pickled goods in large amounts goes through a lot of perfectly good food grade five gallon buckets. It's garbage to them. I mean, they, they'll just throw them away. Some places sell them. The sandwich shop here sells these for a couple bucks a bucket with a lid, which is, you know, that's eight, 10 bucks now at, at Lowe's or Home Depot. More often than that, you can, if you look around, you can find a place, a restaurant that is willing to uh, give you their spare buckets if you ask, or maybe they'll even, you can talk to the kitchen and say, you know, hey, I, I promise I'll eat here. I'll bring the crew out to have lunch, you know, every few days or whatever. And uh, will you hold on to your five gallon buckets for me? I'd really appreciate it. And uh, you know, they might be willing to do that for you. That's a way you can get some cheap buckets. Uh, I'm gonna measure this out because since I'm adding sand to it, I wanna make sure I'm adding about one to four sand to clay sand, or sand to earth. If you know me, you know I rant about referring to earth as just clay. Uh, we earth builders have a bad habit of referring to our native soil as clay or our you know, basic earth that contains our clay element as just clay. And so, you know, if I said, you know, my mix is four parts clay to one part sand, that would be utterly misleading because this is, the vast majority of this earth is not clay, it's sand and small pieces of gravel. But then people who are uninitiated who don't understand think that, no, it's literally, it's 100% clay. And so, yeah, you, I've got, you know, 80% uh, clay in my mix and only 20% sand, if that were the case, which is way, way too much clay. It's gonna crack all the pieces if you ever actually had a mix like that. Actually, a uh, proper clay content is closer to 15%. I mean, it's really anywhere between 10 and 50% clay, depending on, I mean, depending on a number of factors. You know, this stuff is maybe 50% clay. I don't think it's even that. I think it's more like 30% or so. And when I add just a little bit of sand to it, it can crack. I've noticed if I don't add any sand to it, but if I add too much sand to it, it becomes not very sticky. So I just add just a little bit. If I make a mix with two buckets of earth, then I'll just make a mix with half a bucket of sand. Got my sand pile over here, far away, because I was making adobes over here at first. Now if you go to an aggregate company and order just basic sand, they've probably sifted it down to a quarter of an inch, maybe even five eighths of an inch. Just keep that in mind. That's not gonna be suitable for our finer plaster layers for our finish coat. Um, it will be fine, in this case, up to our brown coat. Very often you wouldn't even want uh, that much sand or that big of sand in, in your brown coat. My coats just happen to be very thick because I'm building because I'm building the wall out as much as I am. All right, we just want a half a bucket of that about. And then our other element of structural earth is fiber. People have used many things for fiber and structural earth throughout history. Wool, straw, manure, contains a lot of fiber. The manure of grass-fed animals contains a lot of good fibers. I've got this old straw, which is really not suitable for construction anymore, but I'm just using it to kind of hold together the mix, help it grab onto the 
nails around the plate and help it grab onto the cinder blocks, the screws around the cinder blocks and just kind of help hold it together. I've got some better stuff that I'll use when I get to the brown coat, but I'm just gonna put this kind of old straw material in there. You're gonna get a lot of different opinions from a lot of different earth builders about how they like to mix their structural earth. I like to mix in the wheelbarrow where you can easily lift all the dry material while it's still dry. And then once it's mixed, you can just transport it right to where you need it. And I also like to mix my dry materials before I add water if possible. Since all our material is good and broken up, I can go ahead and mix before I add the water to it, which is gonna make it heavier, especially because we're gonna start with doing pack out which needs to be a little bit drier than our other layers. Mixing a drier mix by hand is more difficult. The more water you add to it, the more fluid it becomes and the easier it becomes to, to mix up. Traditionally, people who are taking earth right out of their ground and using it are just gonna mix right in the ground, like you're gonna dig a pit where your source for your earth is and you can just add whatever fibers and water and everything into the pit and mix it up in there, maybe even stomp it with your feet. I'm not a huge fan of that, but a lot of people like you mixing with their feet. And then another way I could do it, because I've got the pile here, I could kind of carve out a divot in the side of the pile, add my water and stuff into that and just kind of mix the material there. I like to do it like this with a wheelbarrow or in a bucket too. I dug a, kind of carved this into a volcano where there's a hole in the middle I'm gonna pour the water into that. Good amount. If anything, I actually prefer adding a little too much water to too little and then adding dry material back in. I feel like that makes things a little bit easier. And I'm just gonna go around, get all the way down to the bottom, pull the material on the side back into the middle, all the way around, go around, start going back and forth. There we go. May have put a little too much water in there. We'll see. It feels a little wet. I'll just add a shovel each of uh, sand and clay until I get a good, good consistency for the pack out. For the pack out, we're not so much mixing plaster. We are doing more like a cob mixture. And in fact, packing out here is pretty much going to be like cobbing. For those of you who don't know, cob is the European favorite method of earth building where you just take a structural earth mix and you make it into balls and then you pack those balls onto each other to build your wall and you basically build the wall freeform and sculpt it. This might be good for the scratch coat. I want to start with pack out so I want it to be a little bit drier. Let's see what this does. I new material like this. I like to just go back and forth that dry material fall in, fall in behind where your tool's going. That's better. All right, let's see what we got here. Nice thing about working with earth, don't have to be afraid of using your hands. Concrete, lime, these things have caustic properties. It will cause you to have burns if you handle it too much. But earth, your hands may dry out a bit, but you just put some moisturizer on. The literal meaning of the word cob is clay lump. A cob is this, it's this ball of clay and or of clayful soil, I should say, that I've just formed. So our area we need to pack out is up there. These sprayers, which are really meant for uh, herbicides, pesticides, they actually work. Oops, I forgot to depressurize it. Always depressurize these depressurize these when you are done working for a day because eventually leaving them under pressure is what will cause them to wear out fast. But these are great for soaking an earth wall, getting it ready for new material. These are one tool that's worth spending a few extra bucks and getting the second to cheapest model. The cheapest ones don't work very well and they don't work for very long, but if you just spend a few bucks extra and get like the next model up, it's one of those tools that it's worth it. They last a lot longer. And you just pump this up. Even though the concrete and the wood aren't going to bond with the uh, material, if we get it wet, that'll still help the new clay kind of like soak, on, uh, stick onto it better. And it helps to get the uh, previous dry material good and wet too, so it'll bite into that. All right, we got our cob-like 
pretty dry mix here. Too dry to really spread with the trowel, but just right for this. Toss it between your hands to get it nice and, uh, how do I put this? You're aligning the particles and you're spreading the clay in between and around all the sand and the aggregate and the fibers and you're just aligning everything and getting everything nice and nice and solid. And once we have our cob, we're just gonna slap it on there. One good strong slap is best. You don't wanna play with it too much. The more you play with it, it's just gonna separate from the that initial bond and kind of fall off more and more. We want to, uh, as much as we can, keep our keep our material, just put our your material on in one. And it goes faster that way too. Once you're better at it, you can just slap it on there, leave it there, and move on. So it grabs, it's sitting on this ledge here. It's grabbing onto the nails up here and then it's kind of holding onto itself. So it should, when the scratch coat goes over, even though it's not bonded to this, concrete here at all. It's got the bond up here and the bond down here, so it should still hold together just fine. If I was really worried about it, I could do the same treatment to the concrete beam up here as I did on the center block. Throw some more of that up. Pack it. Throw it. Oh, that one didn't go on very well. There we go. Give it a nice, uh, it's like a flick. Like you, you wanna flick it against the wall almost. Give that clay enough force not so much force that it just totally blows apart, but enough force that it spreads out over whatever it's going on to. Kind of exploded a little bit. I'm gonna get some smaller pieces. You can spit it on. That's what we call this one. We take smaller pieces and just kind of take them bit by bit. Like that. It's called spitting. I don't want any pieces of this to be way far. It can be a little bit. Um, hanging out from the core wall, but I basically want to try and get it roughly at the level of the core wall. It just has to be packed out enough that when the scratch coat goes on, it'll be already have enough material underneath it that it's not going to sag. Stuff is nice and sticky. Not as sticky as cob you get in a less deserty setting. Not a lot of life in this soil, which is really what makes cob nice and sticky but it's got a good, really good clay, and it's got a really great distribution of particles. And then the straw also helping kind of hold things together, adding tensile strength. Structural earth, just by the nature of it, if it's well-made, has a very good compressive strength, but it doesn't have very good tensile strength. And so when you add the straw into the mix, it helps add tensile strength. Personally, I kind of think that we overuse fiber in structural earth in modern American earth building culture, especially in, you know, go to Oregon. They're gonna tell you to put 30% fibers in your mix potentially. And uh, that's just, I think that's way too much fiber. It's not that it's too much fiber, it's just that it's not, it's an unnecessarily high amount of fiber, especially if you want your earth to be, to function as a thermal battery. A straw is, straw and fibers are not massive. They're not, they don't store heat well. And so the more of it you add to your mix, the less of a thermal battery it's going to be. Now that doesn't matter with this building but a lot of times you want your wall to contribute as much as possible to the passive perform temperature control performance of your home. And in that case, you know, you wanna have it really as dense mass as possible. That initial hard throw also makes it uh, squish around the screw, the nails up here and grip onto them. And that's what's, that's our mechanical tie for this material is those nails put some up top here just to help when we go to make a night make a ledge here with the scratch coat and there you have it there's your pack out so when we go to put our scratch coat over this it'll have something to hang on to now we're gonna do some scratch coat this stuff is a little bit too dry to trowel so we're gonna add a little water to it Oop, that was probably too much water. Yeah, I just put way too much water. Yep. Yeah, let's go get more dry. This material has only been sifted down to a half an inch, which is probably still got some rocks in it that are a little big for most scratch coats, but in my case, I'm building the wall out thick enough that those uh, stones aren't really gonna get in the way too much. That, that bigger than a quarter inch, less than a half inch gravel that's in there. A little bit more sand to balance that clay out. 
The reason I add sand to the mix is because without it, the fill dirt that I bought has a little too much clay and I will probably get some cracks forming in the wall. Shrinkage cracks form because clay expands when it gets wet and then as it dries, it shrinks. And if there's too much clay in your mix, you will get cracks because of all the shrinkage that's happening. So you add sand to the mix to just balance out the clay content, prevent shrinkage cracks. And for the scratch coat, it's fine. If I add some shrinkage cracks, in fact, when I first started over there, uh, I was just using the raw earth and that's how I know that this stuff cracks without any sand. This stuff, I started using the sand so you don't see any cracks really forming. It's fine if some cracks form, especially in just, if it's just the scratch coat. Still, I'd like to avoid it if possible. It's just good bit, good practice. Still a little bit wet. Maybe not. Nah, yeah, it's a little bit wet. Let's get a little more dry. Can't tell you how much earth I've chopped with that pickaxe and mix. Let's just do uh, two, two and a half shovels. This pickaxe and I have been through a lot. And actually, you can see how worn down the head is from all the earth I've chopped with it. I've been using this thing for years. I really need to get another one, but uh, I don't know, I've, I've developed a bond with this tool. I can swing it all day long. If I pick up another pickaxe, it's like it wears me out instantly. This one almost feels like an extension of my body at this point. All right, this is looking like a better consistency. Yeah, I'll give that a try. See, it might still be a little bit wet, but I'm gonna start over on the other side so I can show you how it goes over the cinder blocks and then we'll just see how far we get. So first step is to take our sprayer here, spray down our wall, even the cinder block, even though it's not gonna soak, just having that water on there will kind of help it adhere to it. And then with the earth, you wanna soak it pretty good several times so that it has a uh, nice soft surface to bite into. As much as possible, we don't want these layers to actually be separate from each other. Ideally, if you were to like just cut a profile out of the wall, you wouldn't even really be able to tell where one layer ends and the other begins because they're just melded together so successfully. That's what our, that's what we're going for. Oh, come on. There we go. You know you're ready when you can kind of squish your finger into the surface a little bit. Oh yeah, see that? I want that squishiness. I'll show you how to use a hawk and trowel later, but right now we're just gonna use the scratch trowel. Here's our scratch trowel. This is what we're gonna use right now as the ridged edges for creating that scratchy surface. And this is the hawk. I'll show you this when we go to do the brown coat because this mix has long pieces of straw in it. It kind of makes it, the hawk doesn't work super well. So I got the wheelbarrow right here and I'll just take with, with my hand right out of the wheelbarrow. Yeah, it feels pretty wet, but I think we'll be able to make it work. I'm gonna start right here. You know what, I'm gonna have to throw that on them because the flagstones are in the way. I haven't talked about the flagstones yet. I put the flagstones down, attach them to the concrete stem wall just to, so that the few next plasters can have something to sit on so they're not right on the ground where any moisture that's on the ground can soak in and damage the, the plaster. And then I'm gonna spit a little more on there. And we're gonna take our trowel squish it on up. It's going to grab onto the screws. We want to get big, big long scoops of it. Helps also to get some of it over here on the earth wall. And I'm using the scratch edge with the trowel to round it up so that we get those lines, those ridges. There we go. I'm just getting a lot of material on the wall. I'll go back over and smooth it out a little bit better after, after I get a bunch on there. Help squish it in a little bit more. I feel like I maybe should have added, I added a bunch of dry material, but I didn't add any more straw. Maybe I should have, at least for the uh, concrete. Now on the corner here, I really want to uh, take it off like that against the corner. And I'm gonna eventually end up rounding off this corner. Once we get to the brown coat, you shouldn't be even be able to see a hard ridge in there.
Once it's dry, it's gonna be gripped around those screws really well and it's not going anywhere. A little fresh water on there. See if I'll get all the way to the top of the cinder blocks before I move on. But I don't want the rest of the wall to be dry in the meantime. Common mistake I was just talking about on Facebook that has led a lot of people to believe that earth walls are weak, they're dusty, they just kind of crumble. A lot of that comes from a very common mistake in earth building, which is the failure to identify silt versus clay in your mix. Especially in the desert out here, for whatever reason, if you shake up earth in a jar, the, the clay will settle on top of the silt. But out in the real world, especially in the desert, like out here, silt very often ends up on the top of the ground. And so people, if they go out to a site and just dig up the surface soil right next to where they're building and use that, a lot of times that's gonna have a lot of silt in it. And silt is similar to clay, but it does not have the properties that make it suitable for construction. Compared to clay, silt is very weak. Water damages it very easily. And you're gonna have a very weak wall if your mix is almost entirely silt and, and very little clay. And walls that are built like that, they you can't even put a good earth plaster on them after because it just won't stick to it. The only real option you have is to use a lath up and then use a cement stucco or a lime stucco. But that potentially leads to even worse problems because if any moisture gets trapped underneath that stucco, it will just dissolve the wall. Wasn't sure when I built this how I was gonna finish the building. I thought maybe I'd do like a lime plaster over the cinder blocks and earth over the rest, but then there's the problem of like how do you seam those two together and ultimately I think this is the right decision. And uh, I wasn't sure about quite how well the uh, screws would work, but they're, they're working fantastic, so. Put this one down here. This material is a little bit wet for this. But it's gonna work. Keep in mind having wetter material also means that it could potentially develop more shrinkage cracks. Um, of course, I'm not concerned about that. It's also good to have a uh, motion kind of like this. We do more of that. Not only are we gonna get horizontal ridges, which are better for uh, putting our later material on. We're also gonna blend our material horizontally, which is also good. When people ever ask, you know, how many layers do you need to do plastering? The answer is really, as many as you need to get the surface that you want. If you want a perfectly flat surface, you may have to do, depending on how you know uneven the original wall is, you may have to do several scratch coats to get the really, really flat surface and darby them, which I'll show you a darby in a little while, and then do your brown coat when you're convinced that it is basically a flat wall. I don't really mind if the wall isn't perfectly even doing one scratch coat and then the brown coat on top of that gets it plenty flat for, for my purposes. Not sure it's really ready for the scratch, but we're just gonna do it. Just go all the way up. Otherwise I could stop here and come back later and do it, but I'm just gonna see. Yeah. Yeah, it's not gonna hold a lot of material. Also, this is a little bit wet for this maybe. We'll see here if I smear that on. See, because we did that pack out, I can put the scratch up and keep it relatively even all the way to the top. I'm just eyeballing. There are tools for making sure that you're actually getting a level surface. Uh, which we'll be using shortly. But uh, for now, I'm just eyeballing it, running the trowel over it until it looks you know, flatter than the core wall was. And uh, while we're still on the scratch coat, I'm not sure, I don't think I can really get this ledge shaped. I think we're too soft still. Yeah, maybe I can. I'm, I'm putting it up there and it's just kind of sagging a little too much. So I think I need to wait before I go trying to shape this ledge up top here. 
because I want it to come out at the top of the wood up here. I want it to come out flat, more or less, and then have a nice soft edge that just comes down into the flat wall. I need to let it dry a little bit before I can build that though. Keep our wall soft. If I wanted the wall to be real flat, I'd probably do two scratch coats if I want it to be like perfectly flat. If I'm being totally honest, I don't know if I have the skill level to do that anyway. Keep in mind, I am by no means a master of this craft. I've been doing natural building, earth building for seven years and five of that was as a hobbyist. 2024 is my fourth year as a professional builder. Basically, in 2020, when the pandemic hit, I uh, was working for the Air Force in skills development, which is an impressive way of saying arts and crafts. I was doing embroidery, uh, customization, engraving, wood shop, ceramics. When the pandemic hit, my hours got cut down to nothing. And I'd, you know, been doing natural building for a while. I did eventually plan on turning it into my work. And uh, now I had an excuse and a, not much of a choice, in fact. And so I uh, decided to go start building professionally. It's working out, you know. I'm not uh, ready to build my house yet, but I'm not starving either. So I'm somewhere in between there. And I just, at that point, after, you know, going to workshops and different programs for a few years, I had enough contacts in the natural building world. And I haven't had too terribly much difficulty finding work. First, just get a lot of material on the wall, then go back over, smooth it out, and smooth it into the stuff next to it. It's also because of the way I did these flagstones. We got some pretty awkward spaces down at the bottom. This is a pointer trowel. You can use this to kind of get down some of those awkward spots where our scratch trowel can't go. Not too concerned if it doesn't have scratch lines everywhere. Be careful when troweling to uh, keep the trowel angled so that you don't dig it into the wall where you just worked. A lot of natural building stuff, you can be a hobbyist or a novice and you can do it quite well. It really used to be that that was kind of the case for most people, that they could do some amount of construction work because you know it was a community effort, it was a village. We live in this hyper-individualistic, hyper-specialized society. We don't really realize how strange that is, but what really made earth building at one time in a lot of places viable in ways that it's not really viable in modern society today is that people could work together to not just to build the homes initially, but to maintain the homes. I'm gonna do natural plaster on this and I have a nice big wide roof overhang and it's up off the ground at least a little bit. So I anticipate that it'll be years before I really have to do any maintenance work on it, but eventually I will have to touch up the walls. In some places for fully exposed earth buildings, especially, you know, it could be one to three years that you have to do touch up work on the wall. And that's kind of unthinkable in modern society where most people don't know the first thing about working on the home that they live in. It just wasn't always like that, you know? All right, All right let's get this material moved. Get it on there right now. There you have it. A nice thick area of scratch coat, but you can already see how much flatter the wall is. And you can see we've also begun to go all the way up. We've also got a bunch of nice grooves and the brown coat will just flatten it out even more. I've already started the brown coat on this corner and kind of come up over the door and you can see more of the shape that the top is gonna have all the way up to underneath the joists. So for the brown coat, I'm using a finer material. This has been sifted down to a quarter of an inch. So it's actually only sand. There's no larger than a quarter inch gravel in the uh, mix. It's gonna allow us to apply it thinner and it's gonna be smoother. Same mix ratio with sand, one to four. I've got different straw for this though. The full size straw 
One, it's it's really kind of rotten and really shouldn't be used, but it's also, it's not chopped up at all. It's got really long fibers. They're gonna be kind of disruptive if, to the ni otherwise nice and smooth surface of the brown coat. A lot of people make these kind of really crazy contraptions to try and chop straw. The very qualities that make straw good for us in construction make it pretty difficult to chop up easily. I prefer to just buy, you know, a bag of chicken bedding. You can go to a tractor supply store and get a bag of chicken bedding for a few bucks. It's fairly finely chopped and uh, it looks great in even in a finish if you want to have it in a finish of your mix. But uh, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do for the finishes on this building yet. So I'm just going to use it in the brown coat. Give us just uh, that, that little bit of tensile strength that we want to add. Like I did before, I'm going to mix up the dry material. This is kind of like baking too. If you've ever baked, you know that you're supposed to mix up your dry materials before you add your wets in. This is already mixing up a lot easier and smoother than the half inch sifted earth. And you know, I could have used the quarter inch stuff for the uh, scratch coat too. And on a more smooth building, I probably where I wasn't building out as much, I probably would. The only really advantage to using the less finely sifted material is that you use less of your clay because you've got larger rocks in the mix that are bulking it out and it's gonna make your overall earth go farther. We're gonna make our volcano, grab our water. This is gonna be a little bit wet because uh, it's gonna go on thinner and it's a finer mix, so it can be wetter, which is gonna help us spread it better too. Again, we mix, go around, pull the stuff on the side into the middle, let that water flow around, soak it all up. This is great if you have two people to mix this way. It's really great, it's, it makes it a lot easier too. Another way I could do it is to put the earth in a bucket, the mix in the bucket and then put some water in and get a nice strong uh, mixing gun, whip it up inside the bucket, kind of like drywall. You gotta be careful, you will destroy a lot of buckets that way. I could also, if I had a mixer, I don't have a mixer attachment for my drill right now, but I could also take my drill in here with a mixing attachment and whip it up inside the wheelbarrow. Okay, beautiful. Yeah, I was spot on this time. Look at that. This is not quite dry enough that you can cob it. You know, it's wetter than that, but it's also not just runny. It's gonna stick. It's gonna have got enough body that it's gonna hold up, but it's gonna spread very easily too. Absolutely perfect. We gotta soak our wall. Get it nice and wet. All right. We really want to soak the edge of our previous brown coat. Get that nice and wet because as much as possible, I want to blend it into the new stuff, and not have a seam there. Kind of the point of the brown coat is that we get rid of our seams. And we make our nice smooth surface for the finish coat so that we don't have to think about that when we're doing the finish. We can just focus on the aesthetics. Okay, so this tool is a hawk. And this is just a big flat piece of metal with a handle on the bottom. And this is for carrying plaster to increase the uh, amount of material that you can move at any given time before returning to your plaster source. To use a hawk and trowel most efficiently, there's a maneuver you got to kind of master. And for this to work, it is essential that your mix be able to hang on to the hawk upside down, at least for a split second, like that. All right? Because we're going to get material onto our trowel by sectioning off a, a section flipping it over and then taking it off like that. It's pretty easy once you get the hang of it. All right, I'm gonna start just laying some material on the wall. We're going on thinner than we did for the scratch coat. I'm gonna introduce another tool in a second, which will help us get an even flatter surface. I took, you know, five trowel loads there. That's five times that I wouldn't have to return to my plaster source to get more material on my on my trowel. Even though it's right here, it's still a boon to me. And then it also gives me this shape that I want of the material where I've got this nice slope that's gonna let me put that material on the wall with ease. I can scoop material onto the hawk with the trowel or with my hand, or if you have a scoop tool, 
can do that. I'm also gonna do some more of my spitting in the corner, just cause I find it a little bit annoying to try and get the trowel into the corner initially, especially when I have to bend down there. So I'm just kind of covering up the bottles. I kind of roughly know where they are. Let's see, I'm gonna have to kind of just dig my finger in here and find them, pull them out. This is gonna make the next step a little bit more difficult, but I kind of roughly know where the bottles are so I can reach in and pull the material off of them as I'm going. Yeah, I'm just gonna expose those as I go. All right, that sun is dropping real fast, so I'm not gonna worry about using all this material. Move on, show you, show you the Darby, and then we'll talk about the finish a little bit while we wait for it to firm up. Work on the bottles a little bit. trial get too flat or get stuck on the wall. Sign of a good plaster though. All right. Let's keep this wet. So it'll still spread good for us. So this magnificent tool here is called a Darby. This one is a long, what, three foot long piece of steel. It's got a bit of a taper. So this end is thinner. And that's the end we're gonna use on the wall. And uh, we're basically just going to take our sponge. Get a nice wet Darby. We want water on it. Hold it by the thick edge. We're gonna take it along the surface and drag it up. And because it is a long, straight piece of metal. It's going to help us take off high spots on our wall and show us where any spots where it doesn't hit that are lower that need more material. And then we can add material where we need to. And go over it until you have a flat surface, you can go sideways too. You can go diagonal. You can see all the areas that have been kind of scoured away by dragging it across. Those were the areas that were higher. Now it's been made, the wall's been made more flat. I'm not super concerned that this wall is perfectly flat. So, you know, a couple passes with the Darby, perfectly fine for me, I mean, it looks plenty flat even though I know there's variations in it. Now once we've darbied it to satisfaction, we can now take our finished trowel and we can go over and drag it over it with some water to bring the clay back up to the surface. Give us a nice smooth surface on there. Take out any obvious ridges and big imperfections fill those areas in with clay. I can get more material if I need, if I find a spot that needs more material. I want this brown coat to basically be the final shape of the wall that the finished coat is also gonna show. So I want it as nice as possible, but, oh, crap. Yeah. Doesn't have to be perfect. All right, that's looking pretty nice. I'll show you, there's still one more step to this, but uh, we'll let that firm up. I'll work on these bottles, uncovering these bottles a little bit and we can talk about the finish. So I still haven't exactly decided what I'm gonna do for the finish plaster. It'll basically be the same material as this stuff, except it will be sifted a lot finer. When I go to do the finish, it will be sifted through this eighth inch uh, replacement door screen so it'll be a much finer material. And I'm gonna add some kind of a polymerizing agent to it. So because it's a finish, 
I want some, uh, I want it to be a protective layer. And for that, we need some natural enzymes or other kind of polymers that will help make it a more waterproof or water resistant, I should say, surface. You know, this doesn't need to be perfect, but I'm just gonna kinda go around the bottles and try to clear them to the point that fully exposed. So some options for finished plaster additive. I have a neighbor who has some horses. Horse manure is a great additive or cow manure. Basically the manure of grass fed animals, particularly cows and, and horses. You can break it apart easily. Goat manure, sheep manure, they have these little pellets which are pretty hard and they're not quite as easy to break apart, but a, a cow pie or uh, horse manure is uh, a lot easier to mix into a, a plaster mix. And it has organic enzymes that are great for polymerizing the plaster as well as finely chopped fibers from the animal's digestion, that the, the fibers that they weren't able to digest, which are the strong fibers that we want. And they're very fine so they don't disrupt the look or, or texture of a finished plaster. Otherwise, I have uh, the KOA campground that I have a relationship with down the road. They have enormous nopal cactus, paddle cactus, that, I mean, you could hide a truck behind them. I could ask them if I could borrow some paddles from their, their cactus, and I could chop those up, and they're spineless too. I could chop those up and use their kind of cactus guts as an additive for the plaster. That would also be a really great thing. I could take either of those and I could marinate them. I could kind of let them, you know, put it with, mix them up with some water in a barrel and let them just get real nasty for a few days too, and that would be even better. But let's see, otherwise, wheat paste is an option. I could cook up some of my own wheat paste, which is just you take wheat and, and just boil it up with water and it makes like a glue-like substance. That's also a common polymerizing strategy for finished earth plasters. I'm not sure if I'm gonna dye it or not. My instinct is not to just keep it the natural color of the local earth and then accompany that on like, you know, the door trim and whatever other places that get painted with uh, a really bold color that goes next to it. And that, that's kind of my favorite is really natural earth tones next to bold, vibrant colors, bright colors. I have one last thing to show you, and that is the sponge float. So I've uh, put this brown coat, it looks pretty good, but there's some trowel marks, uh, some uneven places. I'm actually not sure this is dry enough yet for this, but I'm just gonna go for it. And uh, what we can do to take out any marks we don't want around the bottles. I'm gonna do a lot more around the bottles in the finish layer. Like uh, the finish is gonna be a, a matter of carefully going around and trying to make kind of a nice shape around the bottles because they're so, I should have just made the bottles thicker, but I was just using pre-made ones. I didn't want to cut any more bottles, but I, these bottles are just barely over eight inches long. I could have made them another inch. And then I wouldn't have these big divots that I have to carve out and clean up because they could just be at more of a level with the finish. But it is what it is, so I'm just gonna make the best of it. Down here, especially, you can see it down at the bottom, there are a lot of trowel marks that I don't want to show up in the finish coat, which again, it's gonna be very fine. It is gonna show those things. Uh, probably when we go to do it. So we want to take all that stuff out, give ourselves a nice smooth wall. This is an optional step. I'm doing this because I don't have the skill level to, with a trowel, to be able to make the, to make the brown coat as smooth as I want the wall to be. People that have been doing this for 10, 20, 30 years, you know, they have that skill. For the rest of us mortals, uh, this is a way that we can still have a nice looking wall without having to be absolute master craftsman. And this is still, I'm doing this for your benefit. I, I would actually wait maybe even until tomorrow to do this when the wall's even firmer and uh, it's not gonna show up with all these kind of marks that I'm getting in it. But it should kind of end up, once it dries, it'll look rather like this. A very nice looking smooth surface. Sponging also uh, helps the corner uh, look a lot rounder too. That's something that is really hard to get smooth with the trowel. By the way, this is called a bull nose. A lot of earthen walls do their corners this way uh, rather than a sharp corner because, you know, the material, even though it's certainly hard enough for construction, still relatively soft and uh, very often in earthen walls, if they have sharp corners like that, they will wear down or get chipped over time. It's not to say it's a soft material at all. This is uh, very hard stuff, really solid material, but uh, we still like to have those round bullnose corners. Mm, you can still feel the warmth 
from the sun soaking into this wall coming off. Nearly every society in human history has employed earth building to some extent at one point in history or another, including uh, white Anglo-Saxon cultures. You know, we had uh, cob buildings for a very long time and there was this writer who, I can't remember the name right now, maybe I'll add it in the video description, but he was talking to uh, workers in England, I think, or in the UK who had been being, being put up in cob housing and they got moved to like modern style of housing and they described it as going out of warm life into a cold grave. We don't understand what we've lost because here in the United States there's so little earth building with the exception of like the uh, the pueblos and a few other notable exceptions. Uh, we have very little old old earthen construction and uh, a very low rate of earthen construction that people live in compared with a lot of other countries. It's really sad because, you know, I've been in these buildings, I know how wonderful they feel to be in and just how therapeutic it is. And uh, anyway, I'm rambling. I hope that you found this video educational and inspiring and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you for watching my video. Please hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Digital transcripts of most of my videos, as well as some other goodies, are available on my Buy Me A Coffee donation page. Link is in the video description. If you think that sustainable development, earth building, and other appropriate technologies are as important as I do, then please consider donating whatever you can. It'll mean a lot to me and help me create more higher quality content. Thank you, have a great day, and remember to go outside and build something.